Okay, with telling us about no signal improvements. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the topic of this talk is uh, no signaling proofs. I'm going to explain what it is. And the result, what we show, is that any no signaling proof with, at most, square root log n provers or order square root log n provers is in p-space. So I'll explain what it is. This is joint work with a student from MIT, Diraj Holden. Uh, I wish he was here to give the talk, but unfortunately for you, it's me. So, okay, so let's start. So uh, the proof system we're gonna, proof model we're gonna consider today is that of multi-prover interactive proofs. So in a multi, so this notion was introduced by uh, Beno, Goldas, Kilian, and Vigdelson. And <coughs> a, this proof model really is kind of gave the birth to PCP. It's a very influential uh, proof model. And here there's two provers that are soon not to interact. A, and uh, it was inspired by, the goal was to get zero knowledge or information third zero knowledge. But what was really surprising, what was shown a few years after it was introduced by, by, by Fotno and Lund, is that this is a very, very powerful proof system. Namely, you can prove any language in NEXP, you, assuming you have two provers that do not interact. Okay? But the power of this proof system really stems from the fact that these provers do not interact at all. They behave completely locally. And you can think about it, the reason this is so powerful is it's very hard to cheat in this model, because if you're a cheater, you need to cheat in a way that's consistent. And essentially, that's how these uh, proofs work. Uh, the verifier tries to check if uh, consistency, and it's very hard to, to cheat in a consistent manner. Okay, uh, what we're gonna talk today is about a different cheating strategy, as opposed to allowing the provers only restricting them to behave completely locally. So I can, prover one can only answer to query one, prover two only to query two. We're gonna consider what's called no signaling strategies. So no signaling strategies uh, were introduced in the uh, context of quantum mechanics. And in a no signaling strategy, the provers can actually interact. Okay, so actually the provers see both queries. But their hands are tied. Okay, they see both queries. However, prover one's answer, even though he sees the other query, should not, if you see the answer, it should not signal any information about what the other query is. So let me uh, explain this a little more formally. So in a no signaling strategy, no matter what query prover one gets, Q1, for any two other queries that prover two gets, the distribution of his answer, so the distribution of the answer restricted to Q1, is the same. It's the same whether the other query is Q2 or Q2 prime. It's exactly the same distribution. So if you look at this, stare at it for a second, you may think, okay, I'm giving him both queries, but I'm not allowing him to use the other query. So isn't it the same as being local? And indeed, actually, if you think of the cheating prover P star as being deterministic, which is how we cryptographers tend to think of cheating provers, because we typically use the uh, non-uniform model, in which case without loss of generality you can assume that the provers are deterministic. If you think of P star as deterministic, then you're right. Actually, it's like no signaling strategy and being classical is the same. Because as I said, this distribution and this is the same, but it's not a distribution. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 deterministic. So it means the answer have to be the same. So the answer can depend on, on Q2. But the power of this no signaling model is, stems from the fact that the P star can actually be randomized. And even though when you look at it now, you may think, okay, you randomized, but still, what can he do better than being deterministic? Turns out he can. And we're gonna uh, expand on this in a bit. Any relation to what we, to Nash equilibrium that doesn't have deterministic uh, strategy, but probabilistic? Good question. I don't know of any connection. There's no Barrow's theorem or, uh, you know, fixed point theorems hiding here or anything. It's actually more connected to quantum, and I'll, I'll get to it in a minute, where quantum also kind of, the power of quantum is when you measure, it, there's randomness kind of in there. That's, uh, okay. So <clears throat> more generally, we define no signaling for K 
k-prover, similar to the classical MIP, you can think of it in the k-prover setting. And in the k-prover setting, the um, requirement extends in a natural way. In other words, for every subset S of the provers, for any two vectors of queries that agree on S, okay, so the subset of S provers get the same queries, the distributions of their answer should be the same no matter what the other queries are. So it extends exactly in the same way. Okay. So uh, any questions about the definition? It's a good question why I'm interested in it, which I'll explain in a bit, but about the definition itself. Okay, so one question that you, oh, yes. Looking only at the answers of S, you're not uh, thinking about the answers of the other guys at this point. Exactly, I'm saying for any, it doesn't matter. I want to say for any subset of S, the distribution of their answer is the same, no matter what the other queries are. That's the definition. Given the answers of the other guys. No, not given the answer. Just, just given only, if you look at for any Q and Q prime, if you uh, look at the answers given on, uh, of, the chi of the no signaling strategy of the P star on S, whether it's given Q or whether it's given Q prime, the vector Q or the vector Q prime, if Q and Q prime agree on S, so they get the same queries, they give the same answer distribution wise. Their distribution is the same. But if you look at all the, all the plans of everybody together, they may be different. Of course, yes. And they, they will be because, you know, uh, the other provers, they answer according to Q prime and they're according to Q and Q and Q prime are different, so the answer will be different. Okay. Any questions about the definition? So I, I can, I am allowed to look at the other questions yes. when I answer. Exactly, you're allowed to look. You see all the queries, but your distribution on your answers for any subset should not, to, the, the distribution should be exactly the same. So you can look, but you, it seems like you can't do anything with it. You can only look, but you can't act on it in a sense. No, but my distribution of answers can be different for each pair Q, Q prime, right? I mean, so if the, if the, uh, the uh, question of the other prover is different, then my distribution can change. No, look, this distribution and this distribution is the same, when right? For, Q and Q prime. for any Q and Q prime that agree on S. So the distribution really only depends on Q sub S, on the queries restricted to the set S. So there seems maybe it's an order of quantifier thing, but it looks like the distribution is allowed to depend on, you fix Q and Q prime and then you get the distribution. True, but because, it, you're right, but because it holds for every Q and Q prime, if you, you call this kind of uh, distribution, I don't know, some of, uh, it's all the same, it only depends on Q sub S. Okay, so I allow you to see, but in the sense I don't allow you to act on it. So it seems like it's not more powerful maybe. But that's an incorrect intuition. It is more powerful, as we will see. OK, so first uh, thing I want to say is um, you may be kind of uh, puzzled. Why, I'm go uh, why am I explaining the two prover and then, yes? It still would be helpful if you would give the reason for considering why? no signal. Why we study. Next slide. I'm going to explain why we study, why we study in the next slide. The original uh, motivation. The, origi the original setting. I have two provers, and they are completely separate. They don't see the two queries. No, just one. Now they see the query, yes. but they have constraints on the on the distribution. Exactly, precisely. Yes. 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 Does it make a difference if they have shared randomness? No, they can have shared randomness ahead of time. Yes, they can be, in, yeah. Okay, so first I just want to point out before I give, I'm going to spend a lot of time telling you why I think this is an interesting notion, but I just want to say many of you know that actually in the classical setting, K prover, it can be reduced to two prover. That was shown in the seminal work on, that introduced the, no, the concept of multi prover interactive proofs. So you may think, why, am I, why do I need to define both the K-parity setting, the K-prover setting, and the two-prover setting separately? And the answer is that this does not extend in the no-signaling setting. In the no-signaling setting, looking at K-provers and two-provers is not the same thing. And we'll see actually a result kind of to this effect, okay? Or actually trying to get a, like doing a conversion 
in a, some meaningful manner, but we'll see that uh, later. Okay, so to Shafi's question, why do we care? So I defined this notion, it seems a little bit like, okay, kind of very similar to uh, classical in a sense, even though I'm letting you see the other query, I'm not really letting you kind of depend on it in any way. So, and why do we care about it? Yes. Uh, and when you talk about uh, proof, it's essentially uh, uh, one round, uh, the, uh, the one round. Good, yes, MIP, usually multiple inductive proof, Get a query answer, no rounds, just one. Yes, that's usually how we think of this model, and also in the no signaling setting. I mean, it's equivalent. It, you know, in the no, well, you can add provers and then it becomes equivalent, yes. You can always replace rounds by more provers. Okay, so now let me try to convince you that this model is very interesting. I, I'm very interested in it for many reasons, and maybe you'll even help me find more reasons. So I'm gonna give you three motivations for this model. The first one is the original motivation, which is, uh, comes from quantum, uh, uh, from quantum strategies. And then I'm gonna give you two other applications. One is to delegation of computation, and the other one to hardness of approximation. Okay, so let's see these uh, A motivations. Quantum strategies, what I'm supposed to understand is that they don't really see the queries. They see enough so that they can, that this is a restriction on, on what they can do. So, Alex, yes, exactly. So, let, yes. so let me explain. So in the classical setting uh, w that, you know, was where the MIP was introduced, they did not allow any the provers to kind of share entangled state and so on. They were classical provers in the, you know, they're completely local. All you see is Q1. You don't have some entangled with other provers. Complete locality. That was the assumption in the original paper. And then there was a paper of Clivetal who argued, well, and why, why, why was it okay to say that, to assume that you're local? So the motivation was, well, you put the two provers in different rooms or, you know, far apart, and so they can't interact. Okay, so it seemed like a reasonable assumption. So, so let me understand, in, in the classical setting, if the, pro, the prover can be probabilistic, it's not... Yeah, it can be probabilistic, okay. all powerful. Okay. The entire talk here, there's no crypto. Everybody, the cheating provers are allowed to be all powerful. So it's all about seeing all the queries. Exactly, it's all about seeing the queries, exactly. So Cleve et al. asked the question, well, even if they're far away, they may share quantum entanglement. So if the cheating provers share quantum entanglement, now they don't actually act locally, even if they're far apart. So the locality condition actually breaks down if you allow quantum entanglement. And in that setting, what happens? That was their question. And what they showed is actually there are examples of MIPs for which the quantum strategies outperform all classical strategies. So you can do better. Okay. And so maybe, especially today, and you know, it's in the quantum, uh, you know, computers are kind of approaching us, we should consider, you know, the quantum setting. And <clears throat> no signaling strategies is a generalization of quantum strategies. So if you are no signaling, you can, uh, if you're quantum in particular, you're no signaling. Actually, no signaling allows you to do whatever you want, quantum, whatever. I give you both queries. You have only one restriction. And the only restriction I'm giving you is essentially you can't transfer information. Like your answer can't kind of be a proof that actually information was tr transferred from, the, from other queries. And this is just a consequence of special relativity theory. Okay, so it's, it only assumes essentially this uh, model of, of cheating provers says, you know what, the cheating provers can have quantum, can have whatever they want. The only thing I'm assuming is that special relativity theory holds. That's kind of how you, you should think about it. And therefore, it's also, you know, we know that quantum mechanics is not a complete theory, so the idea is, you know, I don't know what theory of uh, physics we're gonna come up with. As long as you can't, you know, transfer information to your ancestors, this model is strong enough. Okay, that's kind of, so it's a very strong model, and it's a clean model, it's a nice mathematical model, and that's why physicists uh, like, like to study it. Okay, but more down to earth to us and to this workshop, uh, What's I think more relevant is the connection to delegation. And what, um, so there's a very beautiful heuristic uh, the, called the pure heuristic or FHE heuristic by Bill Meyer and Wetzel. And what they proposed, they said, you know, take any MIP, so think of two provers, let's say MIP, and convert it to a delegation scheme. So take two provers, commit to just one prover. How? Using crypto. 
So in the language of encryption, of foliomorphic encryption, the way we should you should think about it is they suggested instead of giving two query, queries to different provers, give it to the same prover, but encrypt it using different keys, fresh keys. And the prover will kind of do the computation under the hood of the encryption and give the answers. Okay, so th it, this was a, a heuristic from the uh, late uh, 1990s. And the question is, is it sound? So if you start with an MIP that is secure, that is sound, is this sound, assuming the encryption is sound? And what we showed uh, with uh, Ron and Ranraz is that it's sound if the MIP has no signaling soundness. This is actually, there's no quantum here at all. It just says if, if it's no signaling soundness holds in the MIP, then this is sound. And we constructed an MIP with no signal soundness, and therefore no signal sound was used to get delegation. So, is, uh, so in order to compute the answer in terms of the query, you needed this fully homomorphic. You need the fully homomorphic encryption, exactly. Actually, a computational pure scheme is enough because you can kind of generate a database for all the possible answers of the queries, and then it's like, so it's enough, but it's easier to think about in terms of FHE. And uh, the other, like if you, have an attack, a non-signaling attack, can you break this delegation? Very then? good. So good. So you can say, okay, no signaling, it works, but maybe also without no signaling, it also works. That <laughs> begs the question. And the answer is, no, actually, we know of, a, so this is a paper, it started, this work started in a paper by Dogetal and uh, later by Dodi Setal, who showed that actually, in general, it's not sound. So if you don't require, they gave examples of, of uh, MIPs that are not secure against no signaling, that you can break with a no signaling attack for which uh, this is not secure anymore. Right? And actually, it seems like also in the proofs there's some barrier. It seems like if this is not secure against no signaling attack, if you can cheat in a no signaling attack, it seems like at least there's no black box proof that this is secure. So it seems like really, in order, what, what the, when you encrypt, when you encrypt something, you can't assume that he behaves locally. The only thing the encryption buys you is that this prover behaves in a no signaling manner. That's the only thing you can get from this. So really, what this uh, line of work shows is that actually encryption is really goes, it's very similar to no signaling. That's kind of the, what encryption buys you, is uh, that it's no signaling. Yes? <laughs> Current implementation of FHE or will it contrive implementation of FHE for which it would be called the Lossy in any way? Where's one? It's a relatively natural uh, LWE based construction. Any? No, not any specific one, but a relatively natural one which has positive application, not a contract one. <coughs> okay, any, qu any more questions? Okay, so let's go to the last application. And the last application is to hardness of approximation. And there, what we showed is how to use uh, no signaling to get hardness of approximation for space. So before PCPs or MIPs were used to get hardness of approximation of time, we showed that the no signaling uh, MIP or PCP, if you can think of it that way too, can be used to get hardness of approximation of space. In particular, what we showed is there exists a fixed polyhedron fixed, such that approximating linear program with this specific polyhedron is p-complete with respect to uh, polylog space reduction. So let me explain a little better what this means. Let me parse this theorem. Uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Razin Regev. So what we showed is that there exists one fixed polyhedron. This polyhedron essentially contains all no signaling strategies. Uh, and what we showed is that for any language in P, whether x is in the language or not can be, so this statement can be converted into a linear program so that if it's in the language, the value is one. If it's not in the language, the value is negligible. And this reduction is polylog space. And what this means is if you can approximate this in little space, then all of P you can do with little space. And we don't believe that's the case. So as long as you can, P is not, you know, small space, then uh, even solve, solving linear program with this specific polyhedron, even if you have like pre-processing time on this polyhedron as much as you want because it's fixed, is um, approximating it is, is needs, you need a lot of space to approximate. 
Yes. Uh, this is a uh, no single strategy. It's a, it's, um, it's not a specific game. No, a no single strategy just means you know. So for every, okay, essentially for every set of queries, you have a probability distribution, and y the probability distribution should satisfy this no signaling condition. So it has nothing to do with the game. It's just kind of the condition of what it means to be no signaling. That uh, the definition that we saw before, what no signaling means, it can be translated into a polyhedron. So let me just mention, this was known previously when the polyhedron was not fixed. But if you allow pre-processing the polyhedron, it was completely broken. So we showed that's the case. So if the polyhedron is not fixed, you don't need no signaling. But for a fixed polyhedron, we know how to do it using uh, no signaling. Where does the polyhedron come into the problem? So we have a language, that, and we have x star, and we have a polyhedron, and then? Yeah, so essentially, yeah, so what, what's going on here is I want to know if x is in the language. I have a no signaling MIP for, for P. And this no signaling MIP, I, I, so I want to know what is the maximum probability of accepting this uh, MIP with a no signaling strategy. This is kind of the maximum probability of accepting this MIP, constraint on the, no, the strategy being no signaling. And that kind of the constraint, this is the constraint of polyhedron of being no signaling. Yeah, I didn't explain. This is kind of a you know a talk on its own, but I just wanted to give a, a little. Uh. Okay, so I, I gave. We talked about three applications uh, to quantum, to no signaling, to hardness of approximation, and now kind of it begs the question: What is the power of these proof systems? Okay, what is the power of no signaling uh, strategy? So we, you know, if we're local, it's next, of course. So. At the where is the two provers here? Where, where, where is the? You don't uh, here. You don't see them. Okay, so it's a. Uh, okay, so it's it's. The dimension Yes, exactly. It's a dimension of the polyhedron. So essentially, it, the way to think about it, we know that whether X is in the language or not, there's an MIP corresponding to it, and we can think of whether the. Uh, the we can think of each no signaling strategy as a point in this polyhedron. And the maximum probability of acceptance of this no signaling strategies can be written as, as just an inner product like that. I didn't explain how You need to kind of. Where does it come? Is there any word that you can say where does the non signaling comes in? Yeah, because, OK. Uh, oh, as opposed to local. Yeah. If you're local, you won't be a polyhedron. The local condition will not satisfy linear program. Um, a uh, constraint of a polyhedron. You, you yeah, it's going to be in, exactly. You can't describe it so be described as, as a polyhedron. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Shafi. That was actually good. Yeah. So the reason you need no signaling as opposed to local is because if you're local, you can't describe this as a polyhedron. The space of strategies is not a polyhedron. And this, uh, observa this observation, <laughs> observation is something that's been used anywhere else. That this is a way to describe the strategy. I don't know. In, in, uh, in um, bounding the power of these, exactly. right? showing the signal is an X. It's shown in this way. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Yes. So if co yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna uh, go. So yeah. yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Okay. So now I understand the question. Yes. The answer is yes. But let me. I'll. I'll get to it in next slide. Chef, you're like always one slide, which is great. Because I've probably heard it already five times. <laughs> no. No, you haven't. Okay. So, so what is the power of these no signal tests? So the question is. Do these no by allowing you to see both queries, but tying your hand, do you have more power? Do you actually have more power? Maybe it's maybe no. So here's what's known. Okay. So first, first of, uh, a set of results by Kempe et al. and by Ito et al. say that at least it contains P space. Okay. Now we know even one prover contains P space, so you don't even need two. But because this is only one round, going back to Ellie's question, interactive proof is many round. Here it's only one round with two only two uh, uh, parties. So this is a meaningful result. And they show at least it contains P space. OK. But uh, the question is, does it contain all of NEXP? Right? That's kind of what we want to know. I, I have yeah. a question about uh, basic probability. Yeah. If I have two independent things, then they satisfy no distribution. There, I, I have a joint distribution, which is essentially Cartesian product of two independent things. Uh -huh. Get, uh, um, I get no signaling. Yes. Does no signaling 
does not, there must be that no signaling does not imply that I can give you a joint distribution that the marginals are, look, are in, looking independent. Yes, yes. If you, if, you, if you condition on any knowing other is independent, yeah. but... It's not local. Yeah, it's not the Ex important. Good. So you're right. You, you, you're totally right. You're saying clearly it's more powerful. And you're right. The question is, can you use it to get better, can, to win better in the MIP? So the, you, can, you can have a joint. Exactly. Joint is more. Joint is more. The question is, does this more buy you anything? Because you, it's more, but it seems like this more is kind of not, I'm tying your hands a little bit. So does it buy you? Zvika? OT or CHSH or whatever, where you can actually see that uh, where no signaling buys you something. You're right. You're right. And actually, so actually before we, we talk about it too much, of course it buys you because with, if you allow the cheating proofers to be no signaling, now you can't do all of NEXP. You can only do EXP. So assuming the NEXP and EXP are not the same, I can, uh, this already shows that you know, no signaling strategies are powerful. Okay, because if I allow you to, be, to do no signaling, any MIP before for language in EXP, now you can cheat. And essentially the reason, this kind of go back to, to Shafi's question, uh, is that the reason it's an EXP, I don't know actually who to attribute it, I think it's kind of folklore, yeah, or who? Oh, they showed it? Okay. It was in their paper? Okay. So, a... Uh, so I'll add that reference, thanks. Uh, so uh, what, what's known is that the value of a no signaling MIP can actually be computed by a linear programming. You can convert this MIP to a linear programming, and now you can, if, if it's in the language, it's acceptable with probability one. If it's not in the language, it's acceptable with very small probability. And approximating the value of a linear program, we can do in you know, time that's polynomial in the linear programming. So that's why it's, an, it's exp. This is your polyhedron from before. What? My polyhedron from before. Exactly, exactly. That's why you can use it as a linear programming. Exactly. Okay. So what do we know? We know it's between P space and exp. But now, what is it? Is it P space or is it exp? Okay, so here's what, uh, what was known. So Ito showed that if you restrict the notion to only two provers, it's P space. And uh, with Ron and Ran, we showed that if you allow poly n provers, then it's all, all of exp. By the way, in the abstract, I think it has been updated, but there was a typo that said polylog because I was thinking of the scaled down version. So if you read the abstract, kind of try to erase it. <laughs> uh, and you can read it again. Uh, OK, so, um, so, so what do we know? If you have. A, two provers, P space, many provers, exp. And now the question is, what's in between? Okay, is it, is it can you push the exp to three? Can you, okay. And, um, and the reason we were interested in this question partly is because if you were able to push this further, you would get better hardness of approximation, for example, results. So, uh, so that was kind of one of the reasons uh, we, we uh, asked this question. But the people in the quantum community have been asking this question as well and just wanting to understand the power of these proof systems. And what we show is that up to at least order log n, it's p-space. OK, so all the way from log n provers, unless you can only do p-space, if you have Many provers, you can do exp, and kind of this part in between uh, is still open. Hey, Muli. No. <laughs> uh, okay. Yes. Can you get from the hardness of approximation some bound, uh, conditional bound on the other side? Like that if you can do sublinear, then it will give you something uh, unplausible for, you know, you'd be able to solve P in small space or something like that? Uh, is there like a summer regime, right? Because it. Uh, the fewer provers, it reduces the dimension of your, of your linear program, right? So I, I, you get to some point where the linear program becomes so easy that you don't believe that you will be able to... Um, <coughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's more... Diff it's, I don't know, but it's more, it's more um, a delicate than what you say because the linear program also, go the linear program also goes, grows with the answer and query size, not just with the number of provers. So that yeah, question is... The 
but not the Okay, yeah, okay. So it's not the only parameter. It's not the only parameter. It's a bit more complex, yeah. Okay, so uh, so this is our result, yes? Are there any caveats on alphabet, for example? Or are you assuming anything about the alphabet? Good, 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 good. Okay, so you're, again, also, next slide. But uh, good. So this is assuming the alphabet is poly. Okay, I'm in the regime of, you know, MIP. The verifier is polynomial time. You can do any communication that's polynomial time. The, the standard kind of complexity theory modeling, right? But in this workshop, we're interested really in P and uh, you know, we want communication to be bounded and we're you know, in real world efficiency land and so on and so forth. So one can ask, okay, but when we move down to P, what are, what are your results showing? Uh, to, you went to like real world efficiency. I don't care about X, but I'm not proving things in X. Uh, so let, let's try to translate this result to, to kind of the scaled down version. And in the scaled down version, just to kind of uh, calibrate, what, what's known is, uh, so now I'm kind of saying the same thing, but kind of in a more scaled down version, that two prover uh, no signaling, when the communication is small, it corresponds to bounded space. And the space essentially depends on the communication. Okay, so essentially communication S corresponds to space S, roughly speaking. Okay, and what we showed with Ron and Ron is poly log provers, you can do all of P. And what our results now are showing that also square root log n provers or order square root log n provers is also bounded space. And the bound, again, depends on the communication complexity. Okay, so if the total communication is C, then the, sp the space kind of depends, grows with this C. So not, I think you just scale down, like so we log log, right? Well, we just replace the... No, it's, it, no, it's not log log. It's not log log, it's log n. It, it doesn't scale down with log log. Poly n provers became poly log n. Yes. So, so it, but this doesn't. And maybe when we'll see at the proof, you'll see why it didn't become. So we yeah. had a bounded space. How does it relate to the number of provers? Or what does it relate to anything? And no, it doesn't relate. So here it's only two provers, right? It doesn't relate to the number of provers. Well, bounded space it relates to the communication complexity. So if you think of IP, and the same thing with two provers non-signaling, it's the same. Why can't you do all of P? using an interactive proof. Well, of course you can, you can do P space, so of course P. But if the communication is small, say poly log, we don't think you can do P. Because two to the poly log, because we don't believe that P can be, because IP, sorry, IP with poly log communication is essentially like poly log space. What's the, what's the relationship between the bound space and communication? It's the same, essentially. Octopoly, up to, it's almost the same. Yeah, you should think of it up to poly factors, they're the same. So if you want poly log communication, it's like being in, po in space poly log, and therefore it's not P. Well, yes, what? Well, essentially, you, you say that uh, when uh, the communication is small. Exactly. Okay, you, the communication, what you, what you answer is a partition on the probability space. Mm-hmm. Now less partition, you can you cannot then take uh, uh, advantage of uh, of the of the joint distribution. You have an advantage here of joint distribution that you are not doing signaling, but you are answering some, and and you <coughs> you, are, you are doing the the the, the refinement of uh, of on, on the probability space uh, rougher by doing signaling. Uh, the bounded. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a good, good intuition for it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, one. I'd like to add a question about the query and answer sizes. So, yeah. does this also rule out the Kahadamart style, you know, exponential space for the queries with constant, like, constant provers, but like huge query space? Uh, it doesn't, so as long as the size of the query, so you're kind of back in the previous regime, but, but I could ask. Yeah. No, so all, all it's saying is essentially that with if the number of provers is small enough, then essentially your, the space is bounded by the communication complexity. That's all. In both cases. In, but in the previous slide, the communication complexity is big, so you're in P space. If you care about being kind of verified very efficient, the communication is small, then you're less than P space, in which case you're even not in P. But the scale up and scale down are really the same. It essentially both, both scales say that the, at least from log n, square log n 
hours from square log and, and below, it just says, look, the power is like, it's, it's bounded by the, com the space and how, what? The communication complexity. It wouldn't rule out the Hadamard style in which it, the it won't rule out if you think, exactly, yeah. Okay. Yes, Ali. We don't get anything. That uh, application, is there any guesses about uh, <laughs> what should happen now? I don't know. It's a good, uh, okay, so uh, I don't know. There's a good question whether you can still get better hardness of approximation using this, but definitely not kind of the trivial way that, you know, we were thinking. Like if, if we can get, if we could have gotten here three, query, three provers in a natural way, whatever that means, then I think we would have gotten kind of for free hardness of approximation and now really not clear. Okay, so good. So, so now in the, when you think of P, the, of course the uh, gap uh, became much smaller. So for square log n, <coughs> we're bounded space. For poly log, it's P. And now the question is kind of what's in between. Okay, so let me say what our results are a bit more formally. Um, <clears throat> so what we show is that if you want any k prover, if you want to come up, any, any k prover, MIP, if you require the soundness to be smaller than 1 over 2 to the k squared, you can say, why would I want? Well, if you want the soundness to be smaller than this, then you're stuck in space 2 to the k squared. Do we need this in the, in the application to hardness of approximation? Like there, maybe it's enough to get by with constant soundness. Because here, if you set k to be True. small enough constant, you will get uh, a, a... But we don't, yeah. No, I see what you're saying. You're, yes, but you're right. You're right. You're saying, OK, so it doesn't rule out Hard, continue, okay, you have a very good point. What you're saying, this doesn't rule out that maybe you can come up with a hardness of approximation because for hardness of approximation, you just need constant soundness. You're right, but, so you're right that it doesn't rule out, but on the other hand, because we don't have a construction, we don't have, I don't, I'm not, comp I'm not also giving you a const, mm. Stop asking. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, it's a good question what, you, what you're saying. Maybe there is a way. I need to take it off to think about it. So I'll table that question. Whether, because the, so the question of Ali, it's actually a very good question. Uh, maybe there's still, is it maybe even though what we get is, does, it didn't give what we want, maybe there's still application to the hardness approximation. I need to think about that. Okay. So, okay, this may look like very small soundness. And you say, why would we want such small soundness? And the reason is, don't forget, K can be three. Okay, so we're in the regime where the question is, uh, so in particular, oh, one thing I want to say before I continue, sorry, I'm omitting here constants. Okay, so the actual theorem in throughout this slides, because if I don't omit, it became very messy, the slides. So every time I say sound is this, it means there exists a constant C such that if you require sound less than two to the minus C times, then in space, poly in this for some poly. So there's always constant in that point, I'm just not talking about them. Okay, throughout the talk, yes, guy. Some sort of a parallel repetition or error reduction theorem? Good, no. Something? No, and uh, Justin and Lisa actually last year showed a really nice, uh, they had a very nice paper where they actually showed a counterexample saying there is no parallel. Uh, so, so we have no way of amplifying soundness? No. no. I mean, no, not, uh, <coughs> not, not black box, not just taking the, if you just take the no signaling and repeat it, you can, it doesn't amplify soundness. You can try to think of amplifying soundness in a different way, by, eh, but parallel petition doesn't work. Because the reduction is wasteful. I mean, it does improve soundness, but it parallel petition is not singular thing. Does it be from Thomas? Two provers. Oh, two provers. Many provers, what they show, example that no matter how far you go from n, you're stuck in a constant. It doesn't reduce at all, Sorry, like after. Three, yeah. What? From three, is your constant for three, right? For three. Three or more, of course, more. Even in PCPs, when we talk about parallel repetition, we're talking about something that's trying to like, increase alphabet size but not increase the number of queries. 
with PCPs, if you just want to repeat the thing and increase the number of queries, it's easy to do parallel. Work. Right. Also here, also here, if you increase, increase the number of provers, then it's like sequential repetition, then it does go down. This already also tell us something about that, or no? Because uh, if you you can okay, so now you can take you can increase the number of provers by two to the k squared. Yeah. It grows faster than the savings. Exactly. Nice. Thanks. Okay, so let me just uh, go uh, kind of relate this to what we saw before. So note that if k is smaller than square root log n, what this theorem is saying is even if you want soundness one over poly, which is Usually, what we you know we cryptographers want negligible soundness. So if you want soundness one over poly, you're stuck in p space. Okay, so that's how you should uh, think about it. And you're right that you know we can't have you know sometimes we think of oh let's have constant third versus completeness two thirds. And the reason we say these kind of arbitrary number third and two thirds is because we can amplify them kind of to the edges. But in no signaling, we don't know how to do that. So we actually need to talk about with you know we want completeness close to one and we want soundness close to zero. Uh, <clears throat> so questions about the main theorem? Does it matter if you require perfect completeness or not? Uh, no, it doesn't matter, but I do need close to, I need one minus negligible. Uh, so the way we get this theorem, the way we prove it, and which is kind of a, a more general theorem, I should say, that we have, is actually a prover reduction theorem. Okay, what we actually show is that you can go from k provers to two provers. We can reduce, exactly like in the classical setting, but not exactly. And the reason not exactly is because we have a big loss. And what is our loss? We say if you start with k prover, where the soundness is small, you can cheat with probability at most two to the minus k squared. When you go to two provers, now you can actually cheat with pretty high probability. One minus one over two to the k squared. Now, in the two prover regime, you have parallel repetition. So you can, you can make this small, but you'll need to repeat it two to, the k square, two to the k squared times, which is huge. OK, and this, by the way, you can use a more refined version of Ito's theorem of the two provers in p space. A more refined version of that says that uh, such a two prover MIP is actually in space two to the k squared. So if you, this. So with two provers no signaling, mm -hmm. yes, parallel partition works. At the regular, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Justin. So does your result assume like classical completeness for the MIP, or is it no signaling completeness? Well, it's, completeness is the same because. Uh, oh, this one. Or it's, well, I, I mean, it assumes. Com so classical completeness one minus negligible implies no signaling completeness one minus negligible. Because the completeness is just so you're honest, right? So I mean, one is stronger than the other. So I like oh, I see. You're saying do uh, yeah. So we, we always assume that actually the MIP, the honest provers, are, are classical. We don't think of the of the honest setting as being no signaling. Okay. So so showing this prover reduction is enough, right? Because if you show this prover reduction, it means that k prover MIP. You go to two prover like this, and Ito showed that these two provers is in space 2 to the k squared. So from now on, we're going to just focus on trying to do this prover reduction. OK, any questions? OK, so here is the main idea. Uh, the idea, so the, in a nutshell, OK, the idea is the following. We, we do it by going to uh, considering a more, even a more relaxed version than no signaling. OK, so no signaling was much more powerful, right? He got to see both all the queries, but needed to be no signaling. Now I'm giving him even more power. OK, he gets to see all the queries and even be somewhat signaling a little bit. That's called sub-no signaling. It was introduced by a paper of Lancien and Winter in the context of parallel repetition. And so we consider these type of more powerful strategies. And the main kind of technical piece of our work that we'll use in order to get our main result is we show how to go from sub-no signaling. If, so if you can cheat with a sub-no signaling strategy, we show that you can also cheat with a no signaling strategy, but with a big loss. So essentially what we show, any k player game that you, has a sub-no signaling value close to 1, 1 minus 2 to the minus k squared, has a no signaling value 
at least 2 to the minus k squared. Now, I probably have confused you when I said this theorem because I changed the vocabulary on you here. Before, we talked about multi-prover interactive proofs, MIPs, and about no-signaling soundness. And here also I'm going to talk about games and no-signaling values. And so I just want to say that both are common in the literature. We cryptographers use usually MIP and soundness. But often when, when we think of the MIP for a fixed X, so like a fixed MIP, not for a language, but just a fixed kind of, uh, uh, for a fixed input, then often it, we think about it as a game. Okay, so it's, it's just a game. The verifier asks questions, the, the prover give answer, and the value is the best strategy. Like what, what's the probability that you're accepted, essentially? Uh, using the best sub no signaling strategy or the best no signaling strategy. So that's kind of the very common terminology uh, in the literature. Okay, so again, we show if you can cheat on any given input, if you can convince a verifier to accept with probability close to one, at least one minus two to the one over two to the k squared, then you can also cheat with a no signaling strategy, but only with probability one over two to the k squared. So there is a big loss here. Okay, and and, uh, and this this is kind of why our the k squared here, if it was k, we would get uh, log n as opposed to square root log n. So it's this kind of annoying square that. Uh, you probably wouldn't expect it to be much better than k because of sequential repetition. I, I would expect, if I had to guess, the correct answer is log. <coughs> just not the squared. But that's my religious belief. I don't really have much. That's what I'm saying is that you wouldn't expect it to be better than k because that would lead to some sort of Yeah, yeah I wouldn't explain it to be better than k. You're right. Good, yes. Those constants that are hidden there, uh, they're, the same. they're not the same constants, I guess. They're not the same constants, no. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, uh, I think this one is five. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're not the same. Actually, one of them I don't know because we inherit it from the work of Lisa and Justin, and I don't know what your constant is, so I don't actually know what the constants are. And I'll get to that. Yes? Uh, so I was wondering if does this give a different proof that parallel repetition of multiplayer games doesn't work? If it had worked, then you would uh, get a contradiction power result? Oh, you, you're saying, can you think of this as a uh, proof? Uh, Repetition can't work. Uh, can't work just to whatever extent. To some extent, yes, I think so. You can think about that. Because it's not just saying yeah. the parallel repetition yeah. doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so um, maybe I'll say a word about what uh, this sub no signaling strategies are. So, um, okay. Um, so, the sub no signaling strategies are essentially, so let's first recall, I want to say what no signaling strategies are, that we defined it before, but a little different terminology that will be more helpful to define sub no signaling. So no, sign, so no signaling strategies said that these distributions depend only on Q sub S. It only depends, a distribution, it only depends on the queries to the, uh, to the in S. And so in other words, you can think of it, I'll define this distribution as sim on QS. So in other words, a no signaling uh, strategy is such that there exists for any subset and any kind of queries for this subset, there's a distribution, such that for every possible query, if you, uh, the probability, if you, cons if you uh, constrain yourself to this subset, the probability and the answer is exactly what we call sim of uh, S and Q and S. Okay, so this is exactly, it's just saying that this probability depends only on S and Q sub S. And we, that's kind of how we call it. So this is, this, this is just the definition of no signaling that we saw. The definition of sub, sub no signaling just changes this with an inequality. So it just says there is these distributions exactly as before, but now you require, oh, sorry, there's a star. This star should not be here. Uh, now we just require that uh, this probability is smaller. So now P star doesn't have to be a distribution, it can be a sub-distribution. Okay, so the strategy is sub-no signaling. If this strategy is a, is a, it doesn't need to be a probability distribution. It can be a sub-distribution, so it can sometimes abort. And the only requirement is that for every uh, 
uh, q if you restrict an s, it's at most this uh, kind of universal uh, probability distribution. So he has more power. And the power of kind of aborting seems like it only lowers his chance because he's just aborting, but actually it gives him more flexibility because he doesn't need to be confined to this no signaling thing and it's much more powerful. Okay, so now let me, now I wanna. Non aborting, then it becomes completely human, right? If you condition. Yeah, exactly. If you condition a non aborting, you're signaling. Exactly. That's why uh, this kind of, exactly. Okay, so let me uh, end by showing kind of the, the proof idea in a little more detail. Okay, so again, what we need to show is how to go from K prover to 2 prover with this loss in soundness. And I'm going to use sub null signaling strategies for it. So you can abort with a, 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 in a signaling? Yes, yeah, I can have exactly right. So in a sub null signaling, you kind of, you should, uh, the intuitive way to think about it, you kind of need to be no signaling, but you can abort in a signaling manner. That's, I think, a good approximation of the notion. Okay, so let me show how we go from K to, to 2. So actually, the transformation is very, very similar to the original trans transformation in the original paper of MIP. Okay, how do we go? We take K provers, and the way we go to 2, we give one of them all the queries. He gives us all the answers. In the classical setting, we give the other prover just one random query and we check consistency. Here we give a random subset of queries and check consistency. Okay, so we need a subset here for the no signaling setting. But other than that, the same, the same uh, transformation. Okay, and now <coughs> what we prove, how, now what we prove is if in the two prover, the no signaling value is close to one, then in the K prover, the sub no signaling strategy, I, I want to think of it as also close to one because I'm thinking of epsilon as very small. I'm thinking of epsilon as two to the minus k squared. Okay, so I, I have this two to the k factor, but if epsilon is smaller than two to the minus k squared, it's kind of this two to the k gets even. If there's constants here in the exponent that you're not seeing. It's okay. going to look very puzzled. Needs to be smaller than two to the minus k squared. Here it's one minus epsilon. Is it close to one or close to zero? What's the Both of them are close to one, because epsilon is smaller than two to the minus k squared. You, you should think of you should think of epsilon. Okay, but this is still like the no signaling value here is two to the minus k squared, not one minus two to the. But this is sub no signaling with a sub no signaling strategy. Yeah. So I'm saying, if, okay, here, this is a theorem. We'll see how to use it. We say if here you can cheat with probability 1 minus epsilon, then I'm going to prove, and this proof is pretty simple. Actually, I'll try to show it to you, the, the uh, high-level idea. Then you can cheat here with, uh, also with pretty high probability, but in a sub no signaling strategy. Not, not no signaling, but sub, so with a powerful uh, cheater. And then we use kind of the main technical kind of heavy lifting theorem that shows that actually we can convert this you can think of this as being like, of this as still being 2 to the minus k squared, so you can convert this into no signaling. Okay, that's, right. that's what you were missing. So I'm not going to have probably time to talk about this heavy lifting, even though I'm sad about it, because that's where all the sweat came. You go from high cheating probability to low cheating probability. Because I can find the, what? <laughs> There's a lot of sweat in this theorem. Uh, Okay, so, but let me, uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll just show, uh, give you a few minutes of this and we'll conclude. Okay, so this proof is, that's all I want to say about it. It's actually very, uh, the idea is simple. I'm not going to show the details, but the idea is very simple. The idea is that if I have a no signaling strategy here that succeeds with very high probability, I'll tell you what I'll do here. So now the cheating prover, he can be sub no signaling, he gets all the queries. What does he do? Well, what he will do, he will use his two prover, a cheater. What he will do, he will give one prover all his queries and the other prover a random subset of the queries. But he'll do that for every single subset. So he will run this prover two to the k times. Okay, so again, he gets his k provers. I'm talking, now I'm, I'm constructing a prover here. So he's getting all the k provers. For every possible subset, he's gonna run this prover. 
here are all my queries, and here are a subset of my queries. If, if even one of them is rejecting, he's going to say reject. So I'm aborting. So now I'm aborting. And that's why it's subnode signaling. Because he's allowed to, to abort in a signaling manner. If all of them are accepting, then he'll just output a random one. It doesn't matter which one. They're all the same distribution because it's no signaling. So he'll output, let's say, random uh, answers here. And from a union bound, it's pretty, pretty easy to see that you lose only 1 minus 2 to the k, uh, like just you lose 2 to the k times epsilon. What's a little more delicate is to show that it's still subnode signaling, but it's also possible. If you stare at it enough, you see that it's the subnode signaling holes. So that's it. OK, so let me conclude. I'll go through this so and look at all the hard work. See, we had to use the result of uh, uh, Justin and Lisa, and see, because of them, we're stuck with the k squared. <laughs> uh, there's another reason we're stuck with the k squared, but I glossed over it fast. OK, so we need to extend the probabilities. It's still signals. OK, summary. So when you say heavy lifting, I yeah. understand but what's the, the essence? I don't have time, but uh, I, I would love to tell you. The, the um, real problem, I don't have time. Uh, I can say maybe at then one, one minute. Uh, if you don't have questions, then I'll, you can ask that question. OK, but let me summarize. Uh, so what we showed is uh, uh, that k prover MIP, if you want soundness at most, 2 to the minus k squared, then your space bounded. The space needs to be at most 2 to the k squared. So this is kind of the, the picture. And we did it by converting k provers to 2 provers via this loss. Uh, we had the heavy lifting theorem that I didn't tell you anything about. Uh, of course, open problem. So I would love to understand <laughs> to bridge this gap. But maybe this is kind of a technical open problem. But I think more. Uh, interesting uh, is to understand, to find more application, uh, applications for this no signaling. And in particular, I think sub no signaling uh, strategies can also have very interesting applications in cryptography. And in particular, maybe we can relax the assumption. If we allow more power to the cheating provers, we can use maybe Minicrypt, I don't know, to get a, you know, to, um, to encrypt uh, these questions. So, so the question is what kind of, anyway, find more applications of, of these notions. OK, and I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Amy. <laughs> it seems to me, you're not understanding much, that uh, um, there is uh, uh, the condition of no signaling, but there is help because the joint distribution is not a Cartesian product. It's not, uh, it's not independent. It's not a... Uh, right. It's not a Cartesian product. What about if now we look at the dimension of how far is the joint distribution from the Cartesian? Suppose I give you no, I give you distribution, no signaling, but the, the, the joint distribution in some measure is not far from the, from the, from the Cartesian point but, but, but are you talking about the, the distribution of the queries or the distribution of the answers? What? what? Are you, when you say the distribution, do you mean the distribution of the questions of the queries or the distribution of the answers? The distribution of the answers. Well, that doesn't make sense that they're Cartesian. Oh, I see. Conditioned on the queries. Are they Cartesian yeah. products? OK, OK. So OK, now I understand. Yeah. So, right. so, I mean, oh, how far they are from Cartesian program. I have, I, have, I have two things. I have one is independent. This is the original. Or the, the independent, uh, each, mm -hmm. each one is independent. Now we have, no, they are not independent. There is a joint distribution. But we put a condition of no signaling. Mm -hmm. Now, given the no signaling, how far is the joint distribution? If I, if I say no signaling, then it's independent. It's independent. But now I want a joint distribution which is in some way close to the original. How much you can, how much you can help? It's a good question. On, uh, yeah, you want a more refined version. Right, right. If this will not be in another dimension, which yeah. will clarify this dimension. It's a good question. I haven't thought about it. So I don't know what, where, like, if it's a continuum or is there kind of a tipping point? I don't know. I need to think about it. It's a good question. Any other questions? Yes, Lisa. 
What? Oh, you understand. Okay, go for it. Oh, you didn't understand. Okay, so the question was essentially, he said, in a local, you have to be completely local. In a no signaling, you can have kind of arbitrary. And the question is, can you make a refined version and be, say how close you are to be, being local? And try to see if you can say something more. In, in, yeah. Like, it seemed like maybe with some of the signaling MIPs, I mean, I don't think that's really being considered, but with that, maybe you could have a, a, like, a variant of the DMW heuristic where you don't use this mandatory security pressure where you use like a so, so you're, the, you're talk, talking about sub no signaling, yes? Good, that's, that's the question, that's exactly the question. The question is, can you do a, like a BMW style heuristic, but uh, start with a sub no signaling, and what, in, what cryptography do you need to put in there to make it sound? Maybe you need much less. So that's a very good question. That's, it's, supply, it's for P. So Gentry Wix doesn't apply. Maybe you can do public verifiability, maybe you can put there some, you know. Any other questions? Uh, uh, languages do we have these MIPS with sub sub, sub no signaling? Uh, it's contained. So what we shown? I didn't show you, but what we shown this work that with K provers, it's contained in uh, space two to the K. What about, uh, what about uh, an upper bound? If you're aiming for to use it with crypto, you need like uh, right. So it's a good question. You can do it. Um, I mean, deterministic. <coughs> yeah, yeah, deterministic. Yeah, it's up to you. Uh, it's a good question. So you, need to think, so you need to construct this for some large class of languages, and you need some right. crypto engineering. Yes, yes, yes. So if you have another second, what is the main? Uh... The main idea? OK, so the main, do I have another second? OK, I have another second. So how do we go from sub no signaling to, to no signaling? So with sub no signaling, the only thing we know is that you're below this kind of universal distribution of. The idea is that, OK, we first trunk, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show you in a VS slide, it'll be easier. The main idea is to. So, here, okay, that's what I need. So, we, we have a sub no signaling P star. What, what we do, we first want to average it out, get rid of the big ones. The, we want to make sure that you're always um, a, we want to make sure that you're always, okay, let me skip this. Uh, uh, the first step, which requires some work, but I don't want to get into that, is to construct this uh, distributions, sim s and sim t, like before. But I, I would like equality. If it was equality, it's of no signaling. It's no signaling. The first step is to generate inequality, at least inequality. So for any t that's bigger, and you look at q sub t, you restrict it to s. I want to say that this is smaller. I would like to say it's equal. If I can say for every t that's bigger than s that this is equal, I would get no signaling. But all I can do is get smaller or equal. Okay, so that's kind of the first part. It's kind of technical. It's not very interesting. The main interesting part is how to go from smaller or equal to equality. And the way we do it is by um, essentially increasing the distribution. Uh, we increase the, um, the space of answers even. So we allow, allow you to answer to add a, a kind of a fake symbol, question mark, and allow you, I want to just lift it to go up to the same level as sim. So now I'm going to say, oh, it's below sim? OK. So at output, I'm going to allow this Q to output AS in some, I'm try, I'll try to lift it kind of to go all the way to sim. So we have this lifting thing. But even lifting it is it, it's difficult. And even, by the way, even to only get to this, we can't really do it. We can only do it for what's uh, called in, uh, in uh, Lisa and Justin's paper, honest referee no signaling. But they show already how to go from honest referee to no signaling. So there's a bunch of, um, it, it, there's a lot of ideas. It's very hard to explain. Uh, but there's this lifting. If I, had to, if I had to summarize in two sentences, there's this lifting idea of to lift probabilities and the idea that we need to kind of um, a, confine ourselves to honest referee. Uh, yes. What? I, I 
It's, I don't think it's tight, actually. I think, uh, I think we, the K squared that we lose, I, I, don't, I don't believe it's tight in your thing, and I don't believe it's tight. How, how, how good can get? I mean, if what guy asked yeah. can go to my escape? I, I, that, look, that's my guess, but I, I, it's really a guess. It just doesn't seem like the right answer. And when you look at the, why? What is the limit? It's, it seems like K. But even that, it's because, it seems like K, but why do you go from 1 minus 2 to the K, uh, 2 to the minus K to only 2 to the minus K? It, it's not clear. Why don't you go? I don't know. Is there the... the Preserve the error? I mean, you have some bounds? No, you, it, it can't preserve the error because uh, if, it, if, you, if it's too close, then it will imply that, you, look, we can't go from k provers to two provers because k pro many provers is, is exponent, that's p space. So you have to have error, but I think we're losing too much. A we, we take an interesting application. Do you improve this part, the only if it's on? It's a good question. Depends on the, I don't know. You're saying to where, you, you, so you're asking if, how much you need to improve to get like a good application? I don't know the answer. Yeah. So let me just say, this is a, uh, there's a lot of questions. This work uh, raises much more questions than one it answers. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs>